Good evening. And welcome, dear friends, to our Friday evening, our sixth talk on Christian mystics. And it is so good to have your company at this late hour. And especially, especially as it's a Friday night, when many are probably out celebrating a busy week at the office or in the shop. But it's good to come and reacquaint your heart with the Christian mystics so often forgotten. And if you were to ask many Christians today, especially Catholic Christians, they probably would only remember about three or four. But there are many more than three or four. And tonight we're going to reflect on the amazing English mystic, our very own Julian of Norwich. So for now I welcome you and I thank God for your gift of presence here. But before we begin, could I invite you to light a candle for peace, especially this week when we enter a period of solemn reflection from the 8th till the 11th. And this coming Sunday in the UK is Remembrance Sunday a time of special remembrances of the many young men and women, especially young boys of 16 years old who gave their lives, they gave their tomorrows for our today. So I dedicate this to their many souls and what was so tragic in that First World War, Christians were killing Christians. So Father, Mother, God, forgive us. Forgive us for the crimes that we have committed against one another in this Cathedral of God. And now we offer the next coming 30 minutes for the highest good of all concerned and for peace. But I'd like to begin with that beautiful prayer of entry by none other than the Teresa of Avila. So if you haven't got entering the castle in front of you on page 276, then you may wish to choose to recite it quietly after me. I cross the bridge into the silent bliss of my castle. I close the drawbridge and forbid all outside influences from entry into this holy place, a place that is my soul. Here in my castle, I am alone with God and under God's light and companionship, I discover the depth and the beauty of my soul. I embrace the power of prayer. I open myself to divine guidance. I surrender myself to become as a channel of grace, for grace, healing, and service as God directs my life. And the key word there, as God directs my life. And all of the mystics that we will share with you in the coming nights, weeks and months ahead, all had this in common. They surrendered their life, their heart, in service to God as God directed their life not as they wanted to, or as they thought they should, or be driven by egotistical fantasies. They heard that inner voice. They honored it. They surrendered to it. And they weren't all nuns or monks. Some were married, single, widowed and divorced. So there's hope for us all. 
And now we begin by sharing with you from where we left off last night, where we talked about the great St. Francis of Assisi. And tonight we shall reflect on Julian of Norwich. And this is her first beautiful reflection. God is everything that is good and the goodness that everything possesses is God. Meister Eckhart, another great mystic, says that isness is God, but here Julian, who followed Meister Eckhart, reports that goodness is God. Every experience of goodness is an experience of God. Is that your experience also? Since the theological word for goodness is blessing, we could also say that every blessing is an experience of God. And when you experience goodness in your life, to whom do you give credit? A valid point, a good question. When you experience goodness in your life, to whom do you give credit? And another beautiful reflection from St. Julian of Norwich. As the body is clothed in cloth and the muscles in the skin and the bones in the muscles and the heart in the chest. So are we, body and soul, closed in the goodness of God and enclosed. Mm. We are closed and enclosed in the goodness of God. This image is a lot like Hildegard's of being hugged and encircled by the arms of God. Also an enclosing. This is a very maternal and compassionate image of our relationship to divinity. It also hints at intimacy, the intimacy of the relationship. Can you imagine your own flesh and bones as the arms of God holding your heart and soul? Let us visualize that for a moment. Let us experience the arms of God around us. Let us experience the tenderness And let us be whole and fall. Hold and listen to the isness of God. And again, Julian of Norwich shares this with us. God showed me in my palm a little thing round as a ball about the size of a hazelnut. I looked at it with the eye of my understanding and asked myself, what is this thing? And I was answered, it is everything that is created. I wondered how it could survive since it seems so little. It could suddenly disintegrate into nothing. The answer came. It endures and ever will endure because God loves it. And so everything has been because of God's love. Oh, wow. Julian saw all of creation in a tiny hazelnut. And she saw that it was fragile but that it endured because God loved it. God loves 
all of creation. Can you imagine all of creation as a single loved entity in the palm of your hand? Tiny but immense, microcosm of the vast macrocosm, all of it love. And again, Julian shares this. God is thirsty for everyone. This thirst has already drawn the holy to joy, and we the living are ever being drawn and drunk. And yet God still thirsts and longs. Have you heard or thought before about God's thirst and how we help to quench it, you and me. Does the divine thirst draw you to joy? What experiences have you had of this thirst? She says we drink and we are drawn or drunk. Is that your experience also? Do you sense with Julian that God is longing? What is God longing for? What or whom are we longing for? And Julian of Norwich shares another beautiful reflection. Some of us believe that God is all power and can do all and that God is all wisdom and knows how to do all. But that God is all love and wants us to love all. Here we restrain ourselves and this ignorance hinders most of God's lovers as I see it. God wants to be thought of as our lover. Isn't that an interesting observation? That God thirsts for our love as lover. Hmm. For Julian, God is not just love, but all love. What are the implications of that awareness in our lives? Do you agree with Julian that we hinder ourselves by denying that God is all love? What can we do to lessen that obstacle in our self-understanding and God-understanding? Do you agree that God wants to be considered our lover. How real is this for you? How real is it? It is for me, and it has been from a very early age. And when I entered the monastery as a young boy of 16, I couldn't put into words that longing to experience intimacy with God. But I couldn't find the words then. And over the years, over the years, and especially now as I'm getting older, I am so thankful. I am so eternally thankful that God has never given up on me when at times I had given up on God. And all I want now is to experience like Julian this thirst, to allow God not only to love me, but to be my lover, my spiritual lover. And in that love relationship, one finds intimacy, safety, joy, peace. 
And coming back to the great Julian again, she says, I saw the soul so large as if it were an endless world and a joyful kingdom. And I understand that it is a beautiful city. In the midst of that city sits our Lord Jesus, God and one of us, a beautiful person of large stature, clothed as befits his role as bishop and king. And beautifully he sits, peacefully and restfully, in the soul, his most familiar home, an endless dwelling. In the Middle Ages, soul and city were often considered one concept because each was an intersection for so many life energies. In the East, the word chakra also means intersection and has many rich applications. Again, as with the image of the hazelnut, Julian plays with perspective to get our attention. Can you imagine your soul so large it contained a city, an endless world? How might it change your sense of self to imagine Jesus presiding over that city, sitting in your soul as if it were his familiar home and dwelling? How would it alter our view of cities to imagine all souls in them as part of one soul? Mind fogging. And again, Julian says, nature and grace are in harmony with each other. Shame that mankind today doesn't see that. Nature and grace are in harmony with each other. For grace is God, and nature is God. Neither nature nor grace works without the other. They may never be separated. That goodness that is nature is God. God is the ground, the substance, the same that is naturehood. God is the true father and mother of nature. God is the true father and mother of nature. The separation of nature and grace often leaves us confused and fearful of life. When we can no longer feel the grace of nature, we need to pause and allow grace to bless us again. Julian believes that a separation of nature and grace is foolish and dangerous. Do you agree with her? I do. What examples of nature as grace do you have in your life today? Many theologians in the past, such as St. Augustine, have separated nature from grace and in this way have created pessimism. Julian does not. The experience of the sun, of animals, of one's body, of another's body, of food, the truth of nature as grace goes on and on. Julian often emphasized her belief that all goodness is God, and this includes the entirety of the natural world, including all living creatures, from birds to trees, nature itself in the form of land and rivers, and also our own nature as human beings. All of it contains in its ground and substance, God, who is father and who is mother. 
who is father and who is mother. And Julian shares this, God says, I am the sovereign goodness of all things. I am what makes you love. I am what makes you long and desire. This I am, the endless fulfilling of all desires. God has many names. Here Julian offers a few, the sovereign goodness found in all things, that which makes us love and that which makes us long and desire, the endless fulfilling of all desires. Do you agree with Julian that God is the source of our desires and longing? And there we shall leave that part and resume Julian of Norwich tomorrow evening because there's a whole chapter on this amazing, beautiful mystic from our very own land. I want you to just be still now and just come as you are and let us walk this path together. And here, I would like you to come with me on a walk that I do most days for my one hour outside the monastery garden. It's an old railway line where they drilled through the rock face, a rock that is as old as the beginning of time. And they drilled right through it so that the train taking coal and stone from the nearby quarry to the boats anchored in the bay here. And as you begin the journey, let me set the scene. It starts off fairly level, then all of a sudden the rock face goes right up about 200 feet. And where the birds dropped seeds has grown the most beautiful trees. I've never seen trees grow through rock before, but I have here. And as you walk along, you can hear trickling water coming from the rock down into a little pool. And it lasts about half a mile. So come with me along this sacred cloister. I call it my cloister. I want you to come with me and experience the love that I experience every time I go there. You're walking slowly now. And you're walking on a lot of the leaves that have fallen from the trees, more so from the heavy rain and the heavy winds last evening. And as you look up, you see very few leaves on the trees but you see Brother Sun shining his rays on you. And as the path through the rock meanders slightly to the left and to the right, you are aware of a slight chill where you are because of the rock. And you go to the rock and you place your hand over the moss and touch this ancient stone that was once volcano. Because this part of where we live here in Storth was once part of the South Equator and over centuries it has moved with the tides and of course with the the various changes in the balancing of the axis. But you're here in our cloister, nature's cloister. And with every in-breath you can feel and sense the smell of dew from the moist. The moistness of the rocks. 
and as your hands touch the rock face, you experience a powerful energy of love from Mother Earth. And she's inviting you to turn around and place your back, your shoulders, and your head against this sacred stone. And you feel currents of love and energy flow up through your feet flow through your back, the nape of your neck and your head. And Mother Earth is blessing you. She's preparing you for your pilgrim journey, your walk with God. Experience the love now of nature and it's as if Mother Nature has taken a chunk of moss that's formed a cape on your shoulder. And you carry on walking through this dense canopy of stone and trees. It is an awesome feeling. It is a sacred feeling. Because each step you take, you're walking on sacred ground. You're walking on energetic stones, enriched with the healing energies of God. And now you come to a place where you can see fresh water dripping through the rock. You place your hands and you collect some water, forming your hands like a cup. And you take the water and you drink it and you suddenly feel a cleansing of your mind, body and spirit. And now you can see the elementals, the nature spirits, the tree divas, the ancient ones who have worked this earth. And as you look up, you can see Brother Sun dancing in the sky with joy that this child of God has come home to their heart. And you are feeling a deep, internal joy, a joy that you've never felt before. It's a joy that brings an inner peace and a thirst, a thirst for the love of God. And as you walk, you lift your arms up in celebration to nature to Gaia, to the universe, to Father, Mother, God, in this cathedral of God, and a host of angels come round about you, and there is great rejoicing and celebration, because you have found, like with Julian of Norwich, you have found the beauty of God in the Cathedral of God, nature, nature. And you are totally relaxed now. And as you meander back, you walk along that narrow pass, breathing in that pure air into your lungs, invigorating your mind, your body and spirit and it leaves you at peace, at peace. Be still now. Be still in the Cathedral of God and let us give thanks for the words from the great mystic Julian of Norwich. We thank you, God, for the wisdom of this great teacher. Amen. Um.
Um, and as we bring our session to a close this evening, we say the prayer of exit from our castle. I am a channel of grace. As I leave my castle, grace surrounds me and grace protects me. I enter my life under the blessing of God and I remain open to receive guidance from my very soul. Let us now come in gratitude to the Father, Mother, God for speaking to our hearts at this time and for reawakening within us a desire, a thirst to become God's lover. Amen. The blessings of God creation and all the creatures of God be in your heart this night and fill you with the peace and the joy of all that is sacred to you. Namaste, Shalom, Inshallah, Paxet Gonam, Om Shanti, Solo de Caritas, Salam Alaikum, and may the peace of all that is sacred in this cathedral of God, the landscape, protect you, guide you, and sustain you. And now as we blow our candles out, let us blow peace, love and joy to one another. And now together let us form a circle of light and blow peace, love and joy to the family of God in the Cathedral of Light. Amen. Thank you. I look forward to your company again soon. Have a peaceful night and sleep well, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you.